Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to Carmiza, the rebuild of Earl's House Merch's famous red BMW. This is going to be Trunk Details Part 12. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, on the last video, if you recall, uh, if you've been following along, we made the floor or the bottom plates here for the one Zapco. And at this point, we're going to get this thing mounted. And the hope is on this video to get the two changers, the P1 and the X1 mounted, get all this back in the car. Um, get the Milberts in there. Uh, again, just mocked up on my temporary floor. I will be showing some progress my father is making. Uh, that zebra wood final piece is coming along quite nicely. So uh, let's dive into it. And once again, first thing we're going to do is get the holes drilled to be able to mount these bottoms. All right, got all these laid out. Obviously, this one, they're going to, the screws are going to go right into those beams I showed you inside of the amplifier so now i'll go ahead and get these pilot holes drilled okay i went ahead and center punched all of these and i'll use the drill press to get a nice precise hole uh, i'm using an eighth inch pilot hole okay this next uh, part here is going to be pretty critical so what i've done now i've got all my uh, eighth inch pilot holes drilled and i have double side taped the bottom three pieces into the amps and I did it kind of where the beams are obviously uh, taking care not to put tape where I'm going to be drilling <clears throat> what I'll do is just drill by hand from here continuing the eighth inch pilot hole through what I'm going to do is do two corners so I'll do this hole and I'll do like this hole as I do the holes I will drop in an eighth inch these actually are exactly eighth of an inch roofing now so I'll drill this hole, put this in, that keeps that in place. Drill this hole, put that in place. And that should keep it, again, the double-sided tape should do it, but just to be safe, I'll do that, then I can do the remaining holes in each panel. And I'll repeat that process until I've got all the holes drilled. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. All right, that worked out quite well with the roofing nails. Everything stayed very, very uh, aligned. And again, I just drilled a hole and put one in as I go. You might be wondering too, why did you do four holes here and only three here's three holes here? Just to break it up, it's, um, I was thinking about it. I was thinking maybe I'll do four here and keep the pattern the same, but, um, uh, this three here is overkill um, and then over here obviously I needed to do two because of each you know each panel um, and I think I've decided um, I'm gonna have to decide here for sure very very quickly it's kind of the next thing uh, but I think I'm gonna go to a number 10 bolt um, you know fastener for these I was gonna do a quarter 20 but the problem I actually have one right here if I grab a quarter 20 the shoulder, the head of the bolt right here, is like 3 sixteenths of an inch tall. So if I do that, and I also like the way that I do these, you may have seen it on other videos. <clears throat> when I do these in countersink them, I'd like them to be just a, a whisker below the surface. I think it just gives it, you know, where you can see like the, the machining, I think it gives it a nice look. So I'll do that here as well. The problem is these are an eighth of an inch thick. They're going into a quarter inch piece of flat bar. If I go, if this thing's a quarter of an inch, I'm reducing, I'd have to countersink the actual flat bar and compromise the integrity because there would be a help, you know, half the threads. So I'll do a number 10 bolt. Um, the head on a number 10 is just a whisker over an eighth of an inch. So if I, if I do need to open up the flat bar, it's less than a 16th for sure, a 64th probably or whatever. So I think all in all, that'll be strong. And again, with all the, you know, all the bolts on here, this is going to be pretty overkill. So, all right, let's keep moving. All right, before I pull this apart, I just want to show how nice this came out. That alignment trick with the roofing nails. And I, again, I don't know if it's necessary because of double-sided tape. But when you're drilling, you're going to get some vibration and movement and all the little tolerances that get out, um, you know, a bunch of small errors equals larger errors. So well, now we'll go ahead and pull this apart and start working on opening these holes. I would figured I'd show just a quick recap with the pieces off. You can see everything is lined up very nicely. 
really happy with that. Everything came out really good there. All right, let's keep going. Got one little detail element I want to show. Again, this is as careful as I'm trying to be. These panels were squared off here, but when I put the bottoms in place, it didn't look very finished. So I added a little chamfer right there. I mean, nobody's ever gonna see that. Um, but again, that's, that's the level of detail I'm after. There's a little tiny gap there. And uh, so that's what it'll look like. Just thought I'd show that. All right, did a dry run here of the 1024 bolt or screw, I guess you would call it, it's machine screw. <clears throat> uh, did my countersink and threaded a piece of eighth inch just to make sure everything goes good. And I'm happy with that. So this allows me to determine the, the correct size drill bits and all of that. And also I'll use this piece um, to lock in the drill press to set the depth because that's, that's right where I want it. So, all right, now it's time to do the rest of the actual holes in the amp. Okay, if you recall, I used an eighth inch drill bit to go through the bottom of the amp, uh, the bottom of the covers, right? The amp covers into the amplifier itself, and that's what lines up. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm using an eighth inch drill bit here just to line everything back up. So if you notice, I got it all clamped. It's an eighth inch bit that's exactly centered. So now what I'll do is take the drill bit out Go to the larger drill bit, the size that I need for the tap, and put it in without moving anything. And then this way, I know that the hole that I'm drilling for the tap is exactly centered. And then I'll do the same thing with the bottom when I do the countersink and drill that larger. That way, everything will remain lined up. All right, halfway done, I did the one end link and I did this amp. And now I'll do the same thing for the other amp and the other link. All right, all 14 holes on the amp and links are opened up and I did them methodically like that. I put the eighth inch drill bit in at the drill press, centered it, pulled the drill bit out, then put the larger drill bit in and drilled it out. And it took a, it took a while, but again, it's all about trying to get it as accurate as possible. So all of those are done. Next thing I'm gonna do is tap all of these. Again, I'm doing a 1024, just using this tap. Um, and then a little bit of cutting oil. It's aluminum, so it's really soft and pretty easy to go. So let me get those threads cut next. Okay, all 14 holes are tapped. Um, and if you notice, it's probably really tough to see here. I went in with a countersink and I did it by hand and just opened it up again, just a whisker. You can be able to see it better there. Just to take off just the very top of this piece because of the way the bolt head goes through the eighth inch. It's, so an eighth inch is 0.125, the bolt head is 0.132, I think, tall. So um, I wanted to make sure that uh, it didn't bottom out on the threads and basically it can suck the covers down tight. So now, um, obviously again, I've got my eighth inch holes on all the covers. Now I need to open up all of those and do all the countersinks, and then I'll be able to bolt it together and see what it looks like. So let's get going on that. All right, I did a test run on a piece of this flat bar just to get my depth set properly. As you can see, that's kind of right where I like it, where that little shiny part you can see is just the exposed area. So it's just below the surface there. And also I torqued this down, and if I try to turn this, it doesn't turn. That means that um, the threads are not bottoming out. That's why I did that little tiny uh, countersink there. So now I've got to go through and do the rest of the holes in the panels. All the holes are drilled out. This is going to be prior to countersinking. You can see I just kind of set the panels in there, but everything looks to line up good. Now we've got them all countersunk. All right, before I mount this last one, I just want to show the detail on the countersink. And then I'm using my deburring tool to take care of anything on the back side. So I'm going to go ahead and get this last one mounted. Ta-da! The amp bottom is complete. A um, few things, or whatever, at least a couple things I want to mention here. Um, I went through and used a palm sander and some 80 grit and uh, just hit it with that just to get rid of some of those deeper scratches this obviously these are going to be painted to match the amplifiers but um i would say all in all it came out very very good everything the countersinks came out nice 
Um, what I like about using these kind of bolts too is that there is no room for error. If you're using a socket head and you can just hog out the hole, move the panel around and tighten it down and get everything aligned. These, because of the countersink, as you likely know, when you tighten these down, the panel goes where it wants to go. So it's got to be right. That's why it took so much care in drilling all the pilot holes. But look at that final, final finish, I think is very, very good. I've got just enough of a gap in there for paint. I got gaps on the ends. Everything lines up very good. Everything is uh, still making a little tiny bit of noise there, but um, very, very solid. Um, and now I'll be able to go through and um, hang the Sony components with a high degree of confidence. So the next thing I'm going to do is take this all apart, put it in the car, and I'm going to put the bottoms on while it's in the car. These will also help to align these fins. These things are still driving me flipping nuts, kitchen counter or not. Um, they're just, I don't know, I'm going to have to just live with as good as I can get it. Um, I was even contemplating welding the whole thing together, but the whole point of being able to do all this is the serviceability. I can kind of take this, the Amperac apart in sections if I need to service it, especially the Sony components, because I'll have, again, a, you know, a changer mounted to this, C1 or P1X1 here, and another changer here. So it's, it's kind of uh, modular, if you will, in that regard. So, um, all right, so again, with this video, we're going to keep cruising along, and I am, I am hell-bent on getting this, this thing in the car with the Sony parts before the end of this video. So let's keep going, and we'll get this in the car and see how it looks. Okay, I uh, did not put the one Zapco in the car yet. I'm going to do some other work before I do that. Um, so what I want to do at this point is just very briefly kind of talk about um, this equipment because I'm sure many of you, depending on your age and how long you've been in car audio, may not know what this stuff is. Um, and also, I want to offer up a explanation as to why I'm using CD player. Um, there are two. These are 10-disc CD changers. These doors open up. This is just sitting here. And again, these are the ones I've hollowed out, but there's a 10-disc magazine that goes in here. They're clunky. They're kind of loud, the mechanism. They're slow. But there's one main reason, and that is the sound. Okay, so um, with regard to CDs, why I'm doing CDs, and, you know, I'm fully aware of all the new processors and streaming, and, you know, you could just get a hard drive or a a DAP, you know, a digital audio player. I've got a few of those. Um, I don't like them. I much prefer CD. I am old school to the core, uh, which is why I'm rebuilding a car that was originally built in the 90s. Uh, with CD, there's no con uh, connectivity issues. If I've got, you know, if I'm streaming, I've got to deal with internet connection. Uh, I also own the media for CDs. I'm restoring my CD collection. I'm up to... I don't know, 400 or so CDs. Um, if anybody is interested in getting CDs, here's a little pro tip. Uh, Goodwill, 99 cents each. Every time I drive to a new town or go somewhere or travel, I'll pop into a local Goodwill, and that's a great place. I pick up some awesome CDs there. Um, definitely cool there. I'm also very nostalgic. Um, you probably have heard me talk about that. And CDs, just to me, I grew up, um, you know, when CDs first came out, I was uh, in my teens, I think, early teens, and it was just a really cool time, and everybody was enamored by the sound, and that's, that's again, another reason. I will be doing an in-dash CD player up front. These two changers, when they're loaded, it's I really won't pull those discs out much at all. Um, when I'm doing critical listening, <clears throat> um, testing, you know, running pink noise, all that. I'll have a bunch of different CDs that I'll put in for that, but I'll have an in-dash CD player that I will tie into this system digitally up front. Likely a Sony, definitely a Sony piece, but it'll be likely like a C90, if you're familiar with that. Uh, that came out just after, well, 10 years after this series came out. Um, also, it's some other reasons why I like CDs. You can choose the um, mastering version. So I listen to a variety of different music, music, but like Miles Davis, for example, there's a half dozen different 
um, versions of some different Miles Davis um, um, albums, but um, that that would be an example. Or like Steely Dan, I listen to, you know, I'm a huge Steely Dan fan, so like Asia, um, Gaucho, there's a whole bunch of different versions, even newer SACD versions. Earl and I have been... Um, um, kind of getting and collecting some, um, there's a company called Acoustic Sounds where they've got an incredible engineer who's remastering some of these old school albums. So that is another reason um, I can select the, the mastering version. Also, I don't know about you guys, but for those of you who do listen to streaming, to me, it's super glitchy. Um, I've got Apple Music, I've had Cobas, and I think probably all of them. And they all screw up at time, you know, from time to time. CDs, if you get a good quality CD player, like these old school ones, they don't skip. They don't screw up. I don't have to worry about, well, I will drove through an area where there is no internet and the things stop playing. I don't want any of that. I want it, I want, I want the physical media. I want to be able to touch it, handle it, own it. No one can take it away. If the server goes down, I don't need to worry about it, right? I, I can always listen to my music. Um, also, some CDs are not available on the streaming services. Some of my favorite albums, uh, there's a tell al album called Spies, the music of espionage. It's one of the, the most incredible recordings, um, and you can't get that on the streaming service. Or if you've been watching my series, a while back I showed some CDs that I used to listen to in Earl's car. Two of them uh, in this, you know, this exact car. Two of them off the top of my head. Um, the Maple Shade albums, the Mojo, right? Big Joe Mar. It's it's one of the cleanest, most dynamic, most natural albums I've ever heard. You can't get it on streaming. Or Eric Kunzel, um, Young at Heart. Uh, you can't get that as well. That was one of the most memorable discs I listened to in this car. Um, and again, bottom line, uh, some will argue whatever bits are bits, and there's no difference. And if you download it or put it on a hard drive and then play it back, it'll sound the same. I disagree 100%. Um, I've listened to those types of uh, devices compared to an actual spinning disc. And to me, I'll pick a spinning disc. I can pick it out in a blind test. It just sounds better. So, um, again, that's I just wanted to offer that up, uh, kind of my rationale for going CD. Um, I also, again, want to just kind of just basically briefly touch on this system. This is called a uh, Sony XES system. Uh, this was originally, gosh, somebody might correct me on this, but I think it came out in about 1990. So, you know, a long time ago. This was the first, as far as I know, if not the first, one of the first fully digital car audio systems. That's why Earl picked it, because you had the ability to use time delay. And for, for anybody listening and watching this, if you're into car audio, your system probably has delay, and you can thank this system for that because this is where it all started, all right? So what this system consists of, these are, this is kind of a rough layout as to what I'm gonna be working on next, and this will be in the trunk, again, uh, hanging from the rear deck, just like Earl had it in the picture there, all right? Um, there are two main hideaway packs, if you will. They're, fortunately, they're the same size. This is the one for the P1, and the P1 was the main controller. So there is a really cool vacuum fluorescent display. <clears throat> uh, it's a fold in size display. There are no buttons on display. This thing was so far ahead of its time. It's got a really, really nice, cool, uh, kind of a bluish look to it. Earl actually used a piece of orange. Um, it's a, it was a gel lens for uh, like stages and it created like this amber hue and it matched the dashboard lights on the car right a lot of people replace all the the uh, leds things like that he just put a piece of uh, this lens in front of it there's you're able to pull off the cover of the p1 uh, and again if you've watched some of my videos you may have seen that so um it's got a really cool old school like rotary controller that's where the entire you know the, the whole sony joystick controller started with this thing and then there's this piece, which is the X1. The X1 is the crossover and also has all the DACs in it. This device is eight channel. It does three-way um, 
you know, so high, mid, low. Uh, you can do a four-way, or and you can also do rear speakers off of it as well with delay. But again, super far ahead of its time. Everything runs digital. It uses optical cables, you know, just old school cables. So it'll go optical out of the two C ones. There's a there's another hideaway pack I've got. You'll see that in an upcoming video uh, called an XTU 40D. It's an optical switcher, super rare piece. Uh, shout out to Gary Biggs if you're watching. Uh, Gary was nice enough to be able to um, accommodate me and hook me up with that piece and. Uh, uh, nice enough to sell that to me. So thanks again, Gary, for that. I, it was like finding a needle in a haystack. But that allows for multiple digital inputs. So it'll allow for these two changers and then the digital CD player I'll play up front. So this is what the the system is going to look like in the car. So the two changers, these again are just mock-up versions. Uh, I have several of these. Uh, these are not my, my best ones. You can see there's some scratches on these and, and they're not in great shape. So they're good for kind of mocking these things up. I have two that are pristine, brand new, never used, never hooked up. Well, I did hook them up uh, to test them and then found out that the DC to DC converters were bad, so I've replaced the converters. So um, so that is this, the changers are going to stay this same color. This amplifier, the one Zapco, I think I'm gonna paint this same color. I'll, uh, I've done some paint work before on some of my other cars, so I'll go to an automotive, automotive supply place, I'll bring a piece of this, we'll mix the paint, match it, uh, I'll get the same sheen. I'll do some test, you know, um, kind of some spray outs, make sure everything looks good. And then that'll be the same color as the one Zapco. Um, these pieces, just like Earl had them, are going to be gold plated, uh, 24 karat gold plated. And um, shout out to Mike if you're watching. Uh, he had a cool idea about re silk screening um, the components. I might look into that. I think it would be really cool if I re silk screened these over the gold. So. I'll look into that. I think, I'm not sure if he was talking about doing those or the actual um, labeling of like where the, you know, the RCAs go and all of that. And actually, <clears throat> I'll show you that. But the this part you won't see. So I have a bunch of these two, the X1 and the P1 brains. So as you can see here, those are your outputs. You've got your digital in. This is the crossover, the X1. The display comes in here. And also, this was kind of the... The dawn of Sony Unilink, which again, that that basically spawned it for other companies like AI Net for Alpine. This is basically a proprietary language and cable, and this is where it all started. So this this again, talk about being nostalgic. This is like the the infancy, the the birth of all the electronics that you guys are probably using today. Okay, um, the heard the P one, <clears throat> and you can see you know Toslink digital. Um, and just a power and a ground there. So this is what the backside of this stuff is going to look like in the car, uh, kind of through the ski hole opening there. And then the way Earl did it is the wiring comes out here and it'll go up into the uh, main plate, I'm calling it, the, the metal piece that the one Zapco will hang from, and then it'll go into the rear deck. So again, just I wanted to take a moment and kind of explain this stuff. Um, I think it's pretty important. And again, I don't think a lot of you are familiar with it or the significance of this product. It is truly legendary in, in the old school world. And initially when I was designing the car and the rebuild, I was going to do the Z50 that came in the car when I bought the car, which is came out after this and the intention was, you know, oh, this, the Z50 is gonna blow away this stuff. Sonically, um, many would argue there's there's really no difference between the two. It's it, You're splitting hairs and they're really, really close. So this, I, I feel, is more definitive of what the car had. It's what Earl had when the car was at its best. So that's what I'm using. So, uh, sorry for rambling there. I know I've I've talked about trying not to do that, but I again I think this is kind of a pivotal point where I'm kind of uh, turning down a new road, if you will, with the build. So um, the next thing I'm going to do is figure out exactly how I'm going to mount everything. I know what it's that's what the final thing is going to look like when it's in the car. I had to do the the bottoms that you just saw me do and get those completed. These devices <clears throat> will mount to the bottoms. These two are gonna mount together. But the details of that, 
those types of things and the specifics I'm still working on. It's a definite head scratcher. It is, it's definitely, <coughs> excuse me, a challenge with the design, but I'll get it figured out and that's what we're gonna work on um, as we continue this video. All right, so let's get back to work and I'll see you in just a bit. All right, to get these mounted, here is what I've done. I took the back off the C1 changers just to anywhere I can gain a little weight, I will. <clears throat> and then I've double side taped each of these three pieces to the respective floor, you know, or bottom of the one Zapco. This is just the top cover of the C1. My objective right now was to be able to get everything lined up. If you notice, there is the seam for the covers, the amplifier covers. So you can see kind of what my design was there. So now what I'll do is I'll pull the covers off. I'll show you what those look like real quick. And that's that's kind of the way they're gonna be, I think, where the you know the cover is gonna be attached to the piece if I do need to pull it out and service it. And then there'll be hardware where I can go in there and, and disconnect it and um, get it pulled apart. One other thing I wanted to mention too, I'm not, I try to stay away from like dollars and <clears throat> all that kind of thing. Um, really it's tough to put a price on a build like this, but to give you an idea, to put it in perspective, these, um, this setup, the P1 uh, back in 1990 with, you know, the controller and the display and all that, I think was 1300. The X1 crossover was a thousand dollars and the changers were each a thousand. So 4,300 bucks, if you compare that to um, inflation in 1990, it's $2.3 to every dollar uh, compared to 1990. So in today's dollars, it's probably about 10 grand worth of products, you know, with, with what's here. Again, completely different. I get it. Technology has changed and all that. But if you, uh, if you ask me, I'd take this stuff in a heartbeat over the newer stuff. So... All right, let's get the covers off the one Zapco and see what these look like. Okay, here is the P1 cover. So I've got the screws off. So again, very serviceable. I'll be able to take this out. And then that's the cover, as you can see there. So that was kind of the whole concept behind this design um, from the start. So I'll uh, continue and pull the two changers out as well. Okay, here's what it looks like when I'll uh, remove one of the changers. That comes out. I didn't uh, sand that bottom piece as you can see, but once again, you can see where those cleats came into play. All right, let's get this in the car. All right, now all these holes are measured out exactly. I even took care and, again, this is tricky to do. If you notice, I've got a little tiny dot right there. I went through and figured out this way and this way where the holes are gonna be in relation to the guts of the P1. Um, right here, even though there's a, you know, a, a circuit coming through here, that leg is no problem at all. Where I had to be careful was the chips, you know, because they're the tallest thing. <clears throat> and then this is the other uh, bolt location, bolt head. And then the other two are going to be just inside of this. And again, there's tons of room in here. So uh, now what I'm going to do, this is a little bit, a tiny bit tricky. I'll drill a 16th of an inch pilot hole with a drill press through here, uh, through both pieces. Don't mind the bug. It's not a scorpion at least, right? Um, and then I'll, I'll do that probably without clamping it. Um, just to just to basically mark everything. Then I'll flip it over, clamp it, and then I'll do my bigger holes. Uh, that way I'm putting pressure here. If I put pressure with a clamp from this side, I might bend this and certainly don't want that. So uh, now the bug's on my leg. Uh, let me go ahead and get that going. This is kind of a better shot of what I was trying to explain with this. So here's the plexi, got my four holes, and they're just kind of roughed out, laid out just so I can make sure I'm good. This is how the piece goes on. Now I can take this, flip it over, and then I have an idea where these holes are gonna go. Now I'll measure these out precisely. All right, we're moving right along. I uh, tried the stuff in the car. Um, Double-sided tape didn't hold up very well. Um, in fact, with one of the changers, as soon as I put it up there, about two seconds later, I stood back and was going to take a look and it was going to be kind of a milestone and the thing fell. So no damage, no issues, but 
Um, I think it was a sign that I actually have to get this stuff mounted properly. So here's what I'm doing now. Uh, as you can see, I slipped the guts into the one Zapco. That sucker is looking huge, pretty cool. And now I am working on getting the um, P1 cover, uh, basically this chassis mounted to the bottom of the P1, right? So this piece here. Um, notice too, I did go ahead, it's driving me crazy. <clears throat> just hit this with a random orbital with some 80 grit uh, just to get the scratches out and make it look a little more uniform. All right, so once again, I'm using my friend plexiglass, the plexiglass templates you've seen me use. And if you notice the dots there, you can see one, two, three, four dots. That's where I'm going to put the screws. But the reason I did it like this with the plexi is to make sure that when I place these, the heads of the bolts, so I'll show you the hardware I'll use in just a sec, just to make sure that the, not the heads of the bolts, but the nuts are going to be on the bottom of this piece, right? So they're going to protrude into the amplifier. Obviously, you need to make sure, you know, like these caps are really tall. If I had it hit the cap, I'm, I'm going to have a problem, right? So this plexiglass allows me to identify. So if you look in this one, for example, there's nothing in the way. Same thing here. I'm straddling these two wires coming off the transformer. Uh, same thing here and same thing there. So once this isn't really sitting properly. So that's how that'll look. So plenty of clearance, no issues there. And now I can get this drilled. So let me show you real quick what I'm using for the hardware here. Got my kind of two P1s, two X ones right now. So what I'm gonna be doing, quarter 20 hardware, once again, completely overkill. <clears throat> These will be the screws I'm using. And they've got kind of a different head here. They're not gonna be a flat head because I don't have the depth. So inside of the P1, which is why this guy is sitting here with the cover off, I can see what I have to work with. So, Bear with me here, I'm doing this one-handed. If I take a straight edge like this, I can see the clearance that I have to work with for the head. And I'll do the same thing here to make sure I don't put it in a location that will bottom out, right? So if the bolt is in here and it's sitting on top of this chip, touching it, I'm gonna have a big issue, right? So I'll make sure it goes in a vacant area. It's gonna be a long ways away from it. The head of the bolt is less than an eighth, and I've got in the deepest parts in here, and this is the worst spot. This side is no problem at all, but here I have probably five sixteenths, so I got plenty of room. But again, I'm being conscious of these types of things. So from here, I'll take the plexiglass, lay it on here, lay out my pattern, get these holes drilled. This again is still double side taped, and then I can bolt this whole thing together. So let me go ahead and work on that. All right, got the four pilot holes drilled. Once again, I did the trick where I put the, I left the 16th of an inch drill bit in, you know, and made sure it's perfectly centered with this clamp, pulled the drill bit out, and now I've got the larger drill bit. This way it completely ensures that everything is centered. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these drilled. Okay, I've got everything drilled out and I removed the uh, double-sided tape, again, holding these two pieces together to keep them aligned. Um, I love this tool. Uh, Joe from the hood. Super awesome, man. This was sharp and nasty because it's just thin aluminum, but look at that nice clean edge you get. Uh, so deburring tool, if you're not aware, check them out. Um, also, if I was to set this in place, it's really tough to see with the lighting, but I can see my little dots exactly where I put them just to make sure the heads of the bolts are going to be clear. So now I will assemble this, put all the bolts and nuts and washers in place, and then give it a shot, putting it into the ones I've got. Ta-da! Okay. Uh, like a guy who ratchet straps something into the back of a truck, that ain't gonna go anywhere. So here's what we've got. Um, what's interesting is, and, and this is something I missed, I just got really lucky, despite I spent a bunch of time measuring and laying everything out, but I forgot about, I'm using fender washers just to make sure to, to kind of keep everything as strong as possible. That's the play I have, like nothing. But I checked it in the, 
I can put the bolts in for the for the floor and they line up really good. So no problems there. And then just carefully. That's what it looks like on the other side. I'm going to get longer bolts. These bolts are just a little tiny bit shy, but um, they're quarter inch bolts, fender washers. And you can see, you know, with the fender washers, that's where it gets really tight, but um, no problems. So from here, I will, um, I will move on to how I'm going to attach the P1 and X1, which is really cool. Let me show you what I'm doing there next. All right, so now I'm back to using my shell chassis here, the ones I pulled apart. So this is the way these are gonna be stacked, right? This is gonna be the view from the back seat area where you'll see all the wiring. If you notice, there is, and I needed, well, I needed to attach these two pieces. My initial thought was do something similar to this with a nut and a bolt and sandwich the two through each other. But because of the boards, the way the boards go on the bottom, the head would be pretty tight because this side's this side's tighter and the nut would definitely be too tight. It wouldn't really work. So again, notice there is a top and a bottom to each of these chassis. Uh, give me one second, I'll pull this apart and I'll show you what I'm gonna do. You can also see the seam going down the middle here for each piece, right? Give me one sec. So here's what I did. I removed the top of the X1 and the bottom of the P1. Right, those were the two pieces that were, you know, kind of like that. Well, actually, no, I apologize. They were like that, right? So those are gone. Now, what this gives me is a cleaner edge here. You're also gonna have this edge, which will be visible when you look in the trunk. That's gonna be right front and center. So it gets rid of this, you know, the extra material in here. Now what I'll do to connect the two is I will take a piece of a uh, quarter inch MDF, make a template for a piece that will fit inside of here. And I have this same thickness aluminum. I will rough cut the aluminum, double side tape it to the quarter inch MDF, flush trim the aluminum, and basically make a piece out of aluminum that fits inside of here. So that piece is going to be the device that will hold these two together. You'll have the four bolts, um, and that will hold it together. The screws that are used in here also are tiny. The, the original screws from Sony, uh, I think they're a number six. I'm going to a number eight. I'm upgrading those and then I'll show you also what I'm doing as a gusset inside of here to provide board strength because um, <clears throat> typically these screws are only you know used to hold the covers on. This is gonna be now used to hold the entire device. So it's gotta be really solid. So. Uh, I'm going to work on getting the MDF template made for the filler piece, and I'll go from there. I think that's a pretty clever design. It's uh, Normally, I over-engineer things. I think this is an example of kind of under-engineering, where I'm removing parts I don't need, but in the end, making it simpler, cleaner, and stronger. So I'm going to get to work on that. Okay, I um, made up a couple of these quarter-inch MDF pieces, and these again, you can see this is press-fit. It's just nice snug fit um these are not being painted as a reminder these are going to be gold plated which is uh, the nickel plating that'll be on there is the majority of the thickness but it's substantially thinner than paint so i want a really good tight fit so now that i have these cut uh, it's time to rough cut some aluminum double side tape it to this then i'll run it through the flush trim bit and get the actual aluminum pieces for the sides cut uh, if you've been following along this uh, video series I've got, you may have seen the welding that was done in the kick panels for the uh, Bowers and Wilkins woofers that are in there, the 13-inch woofers. So my son-in-law is a, a real high-end welder and works for a fabrication shop where they do stuff for razors. So this is a scrap piece of cutout aluminum uh, when he was fabricating a razor. So gave me the piece. It actually happens to be the exact same thickness, same gauge as the Sony pieces. So now I'll use this to cut out the two pieces for those side plates. Okay, pieces of aluminum are rough cut. Now it's time to double side tape and flush trim with the router. Once again, my Fisher Price tools proved worthy. Uh, here are the two pieces. Flush trim bit worked out great. Again, my router is pretty good, but that table saw is sketchy. Um, so both pieces came out really good. I did hit them with the palm sander. 
and if I put them in, you can see exactly the same thickness as the other material. I did overhang them just uh, by about a sixteenth on either end because I'm, once this whole thing is assembled, uh, I'm going to use the flush trim bit to take care of this lip. If you remember in a past video, I think, or recently, I said I don't really like that little lip. So I'm thinking I can use a flush trim bit on that. The next thing I need to figure out, and this is kind of where, once again, I'm a little bit stuck. I really like the way this is going to look. There's going to be, I'm going to utilize where these holes are, but I'm going to put a kind of a gusset or a cleat of eighth inch flat bar aluminum inside each of the pieces. Then I've got to drill and, and uh, drill these, countersink these, so there'll be four holes in a row here on either side. And then I'll go through these holes, I'll open these up. Um, but I've got to figure out the logistics of which piece I do in which order to make sure everything lines up and gets in there properly. So the next thing I'll do is make the flat bar aluminum. It's eighth inch by one inch flat bar. Um, I'll cut four of those and get those ready. So I'll do that next and here we go. All right, again, I'm kind of engineering this as I go because it's um, a little bit tricky to figure out. So here's what I got. These things are really cool, the way that these frames work. They don't make stuff like they used to. It's all copper <clears throat> and it's all screwed together. So it's kind of modular and I can pull it apart. So this is the side piece you know, kind of like you see there. And so what I'm gonna do is, all they did was bump out this material a little bit and then thread it. And again, it's kind of weak. So I'll grind these flat. This is an inch and a 16th. So I'll take a piece of one inch flat bar. I'll go longer than I need to, but I can't go too long because I've got the end screws like you see here, which keep the chassis together. So I gotta be clear of those. And I'll cut the flat bar, and I'm thinking, we'll see here in a minute, or a few minutes, I might do a quick epoxy just to hold it in place. Uh, but let's see how it goes. First thing I need to do is cut the pieces, so I'll go ahead and do that. All right, so I got the four pieces of flat bar aluminum cut. I used the sander on these two. Um, to fit them in here, they pretty much just drop in, and as you can see, I left enough space for the screws at the end. Now I've got to figure out the order of operations here, because again, I'm going to want to cut these things down. I'll just grind those down somehow, Dremel probably. And then this will need to get tapped, drilled and tapped. And it's going to go, again, kind of back in the chassis like this. Um, and then I'll have to drill those out. I have to open up the holes on these pieces. So there's a bunch of things to do. I just need to kind of go through it and figure out the right order. So I'm gonna do that next and then we'll get it drilled. All right, I am doing this as I go and it's really tricky to figure all this out to do it properly. So <clears throat> I've got everything kind of listed out. So what I'm gonna do first is take, notice I've labeled these A through D. I'm gonna double side tape this in place, even with these, these are kind of high, see that? Um, then what I'll do is take the this, when it's double side taped, put it up on a piece of stock, put it in the drill press, then I'm gonna drill through both pieces, opening up these holes to be this size drill bit, which is the size that came with the tap. So I've got a 632nd tap, because these are gonna be tapped. Then that part's good. Uh, and let's get that done and I'll show you the next part. All right, had to get creative. I double side taped the, calling it a cleat, the aluminum uh, one inch flat bar cleat inside there, used a block of wood, clamped it. Now I'll drill this. This again is the correct diameter drill bit to do the tap in the aluminum. So I'll do this on these four, see how it goes. Wish me luck. All right, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this. Um, see those holes? They look great. See those? Not so much. It moved. The aluminum moved while I was drilling it. So the that's the bad news. The good news is flat bar aluminum is plentiful and cheap. So I'll redo piece A and come up with a better way. Um, I think the problem was I didn't have 
enough double side tape to build it up. I put like three pieces in to get it up over here. So I think it was just kind of not tight enough despite being clamped and then it moved. Maybe I'll try something like I did with the, the roofing now. So let me rebuild this piece and then um, redo what I just did and this time get it right. All right, you guys probably already figured this out. Put it on the back side. Just make sure I lay it out properly, which I did. Now, when we look at those holes, they're perfect. So that'll work. All right, moving on. Okay, now on the chassis parts, I'm gonna open up the holes so that they're just a touch bigger, a whisker bigger, than the screws that I'm gonna be using because I don't want this to be threaded. So I'll go ahead and do that next. Okay, once I drilled these holes bigger in the copper piece, there was still a little bit of the kind of dented out part, if you will, where they threaded it. So I used that little tool and was able to get rid of the lumps, if you will. Now, if you look, I'm doing my best to hold this. Trust me, um, these things are lined up really nice. So that part is good, now on to the next part. All right, moment of truth here. So I have, for piece A, I tapped all the holes. Once again, I have the holes on the chassis opened up just a little tiny bit. Um, and I just double side tape this piece in place right now and it's pretty well centered. Then for the holes on the covers, if you notice, again, there was much smaller, well, the other number four, uh, I think number four screws. Um, and that's the hole in the countersunk. So I needed to open them up slightly, very carefully. Um, for the larger screws and I use a, once again, uh, shout out Joe from the hood. Um, I use a countersink just by hand, just to go really, really slow. And this would be tough to get into the drill press and, and brace. I would be worried about having consistent depth. So I'm just doing it by hand and putting the screw in and, and making sure everything, you know, sits the way I want. So now I'll put this piece on and see how it looks. Success, it worked out quite well. Um, I may open up this countersink just so, again, a whisker, um, but I'll do it consistently on all the screws. And then looking at what this looks like inside, you can see, and as long as I don't protrude past this lip, I'm fine, so the screws are, are good as far as their length goes. So now what I've got to do is work on one-handed with my side plates that I made. Now I'm going to have to figure out placement of the holes on both, you know, the top and the bottom. So I'll work on, maybe I'll, what I'll do, I think I'll do the rest of these, get those, all those done, and I'll do the holes in this last. So just real tedious work, um, but it's coming along quite well. I'm happy with it. So let me continue. Okay, I've got the other four cleats all set, tapped, and just double side taped in place into the chassis hardware right now. I don't know if I'm, I might epoxy those later. I've also taken apart the four rails from the chassis to take apart. Uh, there was some miscellaneous items, fans, things like that on there, and their hardware was gonna be in the way for an upcoming step. So now at this point, I'm going to assemble all of this and then I'll open up the cover uh, countersinks as you saw me do. I can find the right piece here. So again, that's what they look like stock, kind of small. Those are the ones that I have opened up. So I've got to do this for all of the covers themselves and then I'll get that done and then I can work on these. So let me go ahead and get those rolling. That was quite a bit of work. Um, but I have these in there now. <clears throat> you can see I've got them countersunk. That is the case there. And then on the back side, definitely upgraded the strength. That's what I was after here, especially because these brackets I'm going to be putting in are holding all of the weight of these devices. They're two pounds each. Not very heavy, but again, <clears throat> I'm looking for overkill as far as strength, rigidity, installation integrity. 
All right, so now from here, what I can do is start working on finally getting these side brackets attached. So once these are sitting together like this, now I've got those pieces cut. Now I have to do the same thing, drill them, countersink, make sure they're very precise so that they line up. So we'll go ahead and get that done. All right, there's a couple of screws into the first side bracket. Definitely tricky to do. Um, all I did was basically put the piece in like this, put it into place, took a sharp pencil, scribed inside the hole very carefully, did a center punch, drilled it out, did the countersink, and voila. And you can see it's lined up very, very good. Countersinks look good. So I'll continue that process. There's probably a better way. It's kind of late. I'm kind of tired, <laughs> but I'm going to keep going tonight. Um, this is working. It's just going to be a little bit tricky. And everything has got to be so perfect with these small screws. And again, with the fact that they're flathead and they're countersunk, there's zero room for error. Everything is visible, which I love. So, all right, I'll keep going. One thing I didn't show uh, earlier to get these holes set. So if you notice, I have my pencil marks there, but I'm also using a fence just to, to ensure if it's wrong, it's going to be consistently wrong. <laughs> so hopefully that'll keep them lined up. Remember I said I'd show you the failures and errors uh, and issues. Well, here's one. Um, these screws came out good, I would say. And then I basically tried to run a straight line between, so there was this one, this one, and this one. I needed to drill this one. I drew a straight line between these. Then I used the jig that I had for the depth to drill these holes and then did the countersink. And they came out, it's tough to see here, like total crap. They look like crap. So um, I have to redo this plate and i'll probably do it for both sides because that means that these holes are likely not correct either so i'll take these off um, fortunately i still have the pieces of mdf that i used um, when i router these uh, with the flush trim bit so i'll get back to that point the size of them is perfect that's just i got to figure out a better way to get these holes placed so uh, a couple of steps forward and now about 10 steps backwards. So I won't film redoing all of these, uh, getting it back to this point. I'll just hopefully the next thing you see is this looks perfect. So uh, stand by. Let's see. It's going to be a while. Sneak peek. I think I have a solution here. And once again, it involves plexiglass. Uh, making a plexiglass template. This allows me to see and line everything up. And I've got this. The holes in here are literally the exact same size as the screws. This lines up perfect. I did the same thing on the other end. Now I'll transfer this, make two new. I'm even going to go to new MDF because the MDF has a little bit of slop. I'll do new MDF, router the aluminum, attach double side this to the aluminum, and then use this as my template to drill the holes. So that should solve it. And let me see if I can get that fixed. All right, it's the next morning and um, I've given this some more thought and I'm happy with uh, the solution that I've got figured out. And I apologize, but I was hoping on this video to be able to have everything in here mounted in the car. Um, I still have a decent amount of work to do and if I continue with this video, it's gonna be too long, long much longer than I want. So uh, I'm gonna leave this as a cliffhanger and I would say definitely in the next video, I'll have all this stuff mounted. We'll get the changers in the car, um, the one Zapco. The Milberts will be sitting in their locations. They're just kind of, the shells are just sitting in there now. So thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you have not already. Tell your friends. And I look forward to you guys seeing this video and the next video. Thanks again. Talk to you soon.